It's on, brother. It's on. It is good to see everybody. I tell you, I praise the Lord for this church. Uh, just to give you full disclosure on some things, it seems like uh, a couple of different families have COVID today. All right? And so you keep them in your prayer. Uh, from what I understand, they've been away. One of them was traveling last week. I believe. So keep them in your prayer. But I, if you've been around them, you know, just be thoughtful of that and be careful. And I, if you, if you, there's a few of them. So you come and talk to me if you want to be sure. All right. Hey, listen to this. For Sunday school, when we talked about the fishiness thing that we were talking about, March the 6th, the excitement of fishermen and the excitement of the future. Let me help you to understand this. Uh, the growth partners in that are going to be very important. There may be teachers that uh, just simply for one reason or another can't be the lead on going out and really rousing the troops for your Sunday school. So what you'll want to do is partner yourself, some teachers, with a growth partner, okay? And I'll talk to you more about that in the next couple of months as we get ready for the March 6th campaign. But that growth partner is going to be the one that will go out and rouse the troops and work with people and try to get them in, okay? Tonight, the men's and the ladies' studies are going to be exciting. It's at 445, and then church starts at 6 o'clock. But this evening's men's and women's groups, the ladies are working through what's called Resolving Conflict. Tremendous book. And the men are just lugging it out with the pastor. You know, that guy, he stinks. I hate that guy, don't you? Yeah, we're going to have a good time at 445. It'll be fun. Everybody that will come, you enjoy those times together with the men. How many enjoyed Thursday night, the strong men's time? Boy, I tell you, there was some good interaction Thursday. It was really fantastic fun. All right, listen close. Our annual members meeting is on January the 16th. And there is a security meeting with Brother Richard on January the 29th at noon. So remember those, okay? I'm going to show you the 182-182 program tonight. And there are some reasons for that. And I'll talk to you later about that. But Michael is looking for disciples also. We want to make sure that we fill him up with that responsibility. And Sunday school is going to be doing all we can to see more and more disciples made up. And that's exciting as well. Please talk to Tom and Sarah if you would help with the small kids program 
on Sunday morning. All right? We're going to start a small kids program on Sunday morning because sometimes uh, teachers and, uh, pardon me, um, yeah, uh, parents have a hard time knowing what to do with their little ones while they're trying to get educated in the Word. So you pray about that and continue to ask the Lord to help you. Let's pray together and we'll get started this morning. We're going to be in hymn 510, Heaven Came Down, in just a moment, all right? But let's go ahead and pray to get started. Father, I thank you for the morning. I praise you for the opportunities that you've given to us to just lay before you our needs. And I praise you, Lord, for the blessing of being able to get into the Word and enjoy fellowship with you. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to open up our eyes to the world around us, to the needs of those that are around us. And I'll praise you for what you'll do as we yield to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing this first hymn, if any of you want to sing in the choir, it's hymn 478 this morning. Have you any room for Jesus? We'll be singing that in a little while in the middle of the service here. But right now, stand together if you will. Hymn 510, Heaven Came Down. And we'll sing together, my friend. I will never forget After I wandered in darkness away Jesus my Savior I met Oh what a tender compassionate friend He met the need of my heart And dread is dispelling with joy I am telling He made all the darkness depart On the course Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. On that second Born of a spirit with life from above Into God's family divine Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took of the author of grace, he did proverbs, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Amen. All that course. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Who went at the cross, the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away. My night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory. You're doing good. Let's sing that third stage. You ready? And now I have hope that we'll surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when the rich is eternal and blessed is eternal from his precious hand I receive. Amen. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Who went at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Have a seat. Well, tell me if this isn't a marvelous, marvelous blessing today, what the Lord has done. Uh, Michael 
came to become a member last week, and he realized, you know what, before I get to be a member, I probably ought to be baptized. So <laughs> this man's been saved. Michael, are you sure the Lord is your Savior? Absolutely. The blood of Christ has cleansed you of your sin? Yes, sir. I still wonder about it. <laughs> Amy probably does too. <laughs> According to your profession of faith and what the Lord Jesus has asked me to do, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection. <laughs> Be careful as you go out of here. I get worried about old men on this thing. because, Yeah. He's with me on that, he said. <laughs> Come on up here, man. Now, I get you and your brother confused every day. Which one are you? Okay, Drake, now listen. <laughs> Drew, whatever your name is. Lewis. Are you sure you're saved, Lewis? Yes, sir. The Lord Jesus has cleansed you of your sin? Yes, sir. You repented of your sin? Yes, sir. What would you do that last night for then? That he, I watched you. I know I'm just kidding. According to your profession of faith and what the Lord Jesus has asked me to do, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I shouldn't have told everybody about your sin, brother. <laughs> You can beat me up later for that one. Well, now, Rochelle, Rachel, Rachel, I call her all kinds of things. This is my daughter, Rochelle. And Rochelle received Christ a little while ago. And we wanted to make sure that it stuck. You guys know what that means, right? Did she actually know what she knew she was doing? And as time has passed, we figured out that she knows what she knew is what she's doing. Rochelle, are you sure you're saved? Jesus has come into your heart. He's cleansed all your sin. You desire and want to serve Him. You do. Rochelle, according to your profession of faith. And what the Lord Jesus has asked me to do, I now baptize you. In the, name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of His death. Raised in the likeness. <laughs> raised, raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Stand if you will. Let's go into that first video hymn. mystery. Jesus. 
A couple of years ago, I went to the drive-thru at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Nice sign, beautiful building, good-looking menu, and I ordered a uh, chicken sandwich. A few minutes later, they came back on and they said, sir, we're out of chicken sandwiches. And then uh, I said, well, then I'll have that two-piece chicken dinner. About two minutes later, they came back and said, we're out of chicken, sir. <laughs> now, folks, it was Kentucky Fried Chicken. Here's my point. At Atlantic Coast Baptist College, we have courses on methods, how you can teach better. We have a module coming up, advanced counseling, so you can counsel and disciple people that way. But you have to have the chicken. You need the Bible. And so here's a schedule of Bible courses, day school and night school, beginning on this, excuse me, on the 17th. On the 17th, there are early courses. Dr. Ron Seacrest wanted a 7.50 a.m. course. And those of you who are his age and my age, you're up by then anyway. You wish you weren't, but you are. And so you can come to that class and still get to work by 9 o'clock. Uh, on Monday, Doc, uh, Pastor Anderson has a prophecy course. You may say, I took the Revelation course under uh, Dr. Seacrest. Well, that's good, but you know there's a lot of Old Testament prophecies uh, that Christ fulfilled, for instance, and uh, prophecies about things to come uh, in Daniel and so forth. Look at these courses. I'll, say, I'll pick a few and say something about them tonight, but turn the page. On the other side of the page, you'll see our night school schedule. On Wednesday nights, I'll be teaching general epistles. General epistles. They're listed there. On Monday night, over at the college, we have a doctrinal survey course. When you're done with this course, you won't have to call uh, Brother Seacrest as much and say, what do we believe about the, we believe what the Bible says, and you'll know what the Bible says. This is all part of our church's discipleship program, discipling Christians. New Christians, Sunday school teachers, witnesses ought to take some classes. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. You know, it is more than just discipleship, though, because we want you to have a degree. We want you to think about what might happen in your future with full-time ministry. How many of you ever thought, maybe God wants me to go to mission field? But, oh, wow, look at that. Amen. How many of you ever thought, maybe God wants me to be in a church on staff? Anybody? Oh, yeah, look at this. Well, isn't that something? I had no idea we had that many people that were thinking along those lines. You know what, my friends? It would be very wise to have a degree to go along with those particular races that you're thinking about. 
And I'm praying for you in your particular race, whatever it is that the Lord is calling you into, okay? Let me give you this thought too. Brother Garrett, would you help me again? Eric, would you help me again? Reach down here and grab these two clipboards, if you will. Next Saturday is Holly and Al's memorial. And we want to make sure that you get these clipboards to start signing up. Now, it's important that you do this. Look up here now, dear ones. Listen close. We want you to sign up so we know what kind of food we need to have, what kind of space we need to have, so that we can envision how many people are actually planning to be here, okay? So sign up for those. Brother Earl made those up special just for you, okay, to be able to do that. Watch this video as we continue. So I have a question for you today, friends. All week long, I've been talking to you out of John chapter 1 about receiving Jesus Christ and what it means to receive Jesus Christ and responding to Jesus, who is the true light of this world that shines his light upon every single man. And through Jesus, uh, we can be born again and born by the will of God. So have you truly received him? Have you responded to him? He came into his own, the very ones of whom he created, and they knew him not. Friends, do you know Jesus? Christ? Do you truly, authentically, genuinely have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And I'm not just talking about something that just spews out of your mouth. Words of our mouth are cheap. They mean absolutely nothing. Wow. I'm talking about a life-changing, life-altering relationship with Jesus Christ, where you have turned to the light of Jesus Christ, His light shined upon you, drove out the darkness, and then you are born again. You are a child of God because you have received Jesus Christ and believed on him. If you're not a child of God, if you've not received him, repent today and turn to Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, um, there's the kind of love that, uh, that kind of fake love, you know, that thing where you just kind of say, I love you. You're so sweet, you know, that kind of thing. Or, you can do it with the same accent, by the way. <laughs> Gary's telling me to take it easy here. You can say it with the same accent, but you know one thing that Brother Gary has done is to call people, to be concerned about them, to ask them about their life, to identify with them, to pray with them. To be concerned about their personal circumstances. Have you done that this week? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 if you will. Hebrews chapter 11. Ushers you can come. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 16 starts out like this. But now they desire a better country. That is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. And by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. You know, it's one thing for me to stand up here and tell you, Jesus loves you. It's another thing for you to see Him dying on the cross for you. Having been offered up for you. Man, there's a big difference, isn't there? So, the same is true in our walk with Him with respect to other people. If you really love them, show them you really love them. Give them a call. How many of you look around today and you say, Oh, this one's missing. Oh, that one's missing. Well, some of them are sick, all right? But don't you think they might enjoy a good phone call, a good talk? You know, Angie and Jason are sick with COVID today. Angie, Jason, and Andrea, and Dennis, and Charlene, I think they're all sick, aren't they, hon? Yeah. You know, my friends, 
Let's give them a call. Uh, these two families, how precious are they in our church? How precious are they? Uh, so you pray for them and pray for others. I thought there were three or four others that I understood are, are testing positive. They said, I don't have any symptoms, but I tested positive, so I had to stay out today. Well, let's pray with them and talk with them. You look around and you say, man, I see that empty space and that empty space. Well, it's the time of the year for that, right? But we don't want them to go without a good phone call and a lot of love, you know. Father, I pray that as we give, that it won't just be our money. But that we today would be willing to take some time, even this afternoon, and call our brothers and sisters and tell them that we love them. We're excited for the next time that we get to see them. May that be the case in Jesus' name. Now, before my parents start playing the uh, choir, 478, have you any room for Jesus? You come up right after the ushers are done. I'm singing a solo today. <laughs> come on up if you want to. M4. Oh, good. There's a bunch of them. Come on up. Come on up. Come on over here, Peggy. Come a little closer, all right? I, I mean, I guess you could spread out since it's covid kind of time. That's fine. 478. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, 
singing to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the one. Come on, let's sing out this morning. Ready on that chorus. Love lifted me, love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me when. All right, hang on for a minute. On that second, now when we sing that second, I know sometimes we get in the habit of doing things, but I like it when we do the little lift. Amen. Not only are we doing a little lift, just saying that God lifted you, but maybe, just maybe, while we're singing it, the rapture just might happen. So that's going to give you that little bit more lift to get out of here. Amen. Let's sing that second stanza. You ready? All my heart. All my heart to Him I give. Ever to Him I cling. In His blessed presence live. Ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true. Faithful, loving service to, to him be on that course. You ready? Love lifted me, love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me when nothing else. Come on, you ready? Love lifted me on that third. Ready? Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saved. He would lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of that sea. Billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be be saved. Today on that course, right? Love lifted me, and love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, and love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Good job, good job. Amen. Let's sing out on Bow the Knee.
Tom and Sarah are going to come and sing in just a minute, but before they do, as they're getting ready, let me just tell you a few things. The auction for the puppy that uh, Patty's uh, getting ready to do, I hope you talk to her about that directly, okay? It's really interesting and important, I think, for our church to understand the importance of what's going on with Travis. He is advancing, by the way. A lot of people have come to me and said, doesn't Medicaid cover all his expenses? Yeah, yeah, it does. But it doesn't cover their family going to visit. It doesn't cover them in hotels. It doesn't cover some of his physical therapy. It doesn't cover a number of things that we need as a church to be wise about. And So make certain that you do as Patty's doing in offering this very important gift to those who are doing this auction. When is it taking place, Patty? On the 30th. Remember, those of you who were in Sunday school and those of you who weren't, March the 6th, we start our Fishers of Men campaign with Sunday school. It's going to be an exciting time, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Listen close to this. Lisa, who's the activity director at Genesis Elder Care, has asked us to start having services there. It's the first time we've done an older group, a old elder's home activity. How many of you think you might like to get in there once in a while? Okay. Well, you come talk to me about that. We'd be glad to get you involved. Tom, Sarah? Looking at Galatians chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 11 and Genesis 22, 
There are three major texts. I'm sure that there are others that mention Isaac. But these three texts actually name him. Okay? There are other illusions of Isaac in the Scriptures. How many of you ever heard the phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat? Okay. What does that mean? Somebody just blurted it out. What does that mean? Chinese food. Yeah. <laughs> That's the exact definition, Keith. That's the exact definition, but there are other definitions. Anybody else got another definition? Brother Michael? More than one way to get the job done, or more than one concept in the same illustration. Get this. More than one concept in the same illustration. Genesis 22, oftentimes we think of Isaac as a picture of who? Christ. Is that true? Does it have to be that way? On Mount Moriah, who actually died? The ram. The quote-unquote lamb. Not the son. Think about that one for a minute. Let it sink in. They say, well, that that is the illustration. That's a, and I can go in with that. There's a lot of great evidence there for it, but... There's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> and if you take Genesis 22 at face value, you have to come to this reality. The creature that died on Mount Moriah was the lamb, not the son. And you say, now, pastor, what are you trying to get at? Well, I'm trying to get at this. If you go to Galatians chapter 4, and you start in verse 27, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 27. Let's look at this case, all right? It's written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which had an husband. Now let me ask you this. How many of us would be sitting here if Isaac had been killed on that mountain? Well, some of us would. <laughs> Isaac's line was which? That of the Israelites. Ishmael's line was a completely different line. In fact, Ishmael had 12 very strong princes in his line. So yes, some of us would probably still be sitting here. But the fact is... That without Jesus Christ, none of us would be sitting here. Think about that one. And who is Jesus Christ in the line of? Isaac. So if Isaac had been killed on that mountain, would Jesus have lived? No. My friends, here's what you've got to get as you look in at Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 now. Read it with me. Read it out loud. Just that little tiny verse. You ready? Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Woo! Wait a minute. I thought Isaac was the picture of Jesus. What if he's the picture of you? What if he's the picture of every individual being redeemed by God providing a lamb? Say, now, pastor, you're throwing me for a loop. Because every preacher I've ever heard has said that Isaac is a picture of Jesus Christ. Well, there's no reason to rhyme to just saying, well, let's think about that in a different way. You know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11, and you start at verse 16, the Bible says, but now they desire a better country. Who? Well, you and me. All of us do. And these great saints that chapter 11 speaking of, the, the hall of faith, they desired a better country, it says, that is an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Look at this. For He hath prepared for them a city. Now, if you sort of take Isaac, Isaac in, in this light, Isaac is a picture of all of you. 
You know, the only creature that was ever created in the image of God were you and I. Did you know that? Do you know that Abraham having Isaac born of his loins, his very own, gives us a better picture than if you make Isaac Jesus. You know that God sent Himself. Do you get that? Do you know who died on the cross? You know we call Him Father. Did you know that? We call Jesus Christ, Messiah, Messiah, Father. Have you ever thought about this? See, now that's a different person of the Trinity. It's the same God. So when you think about it, it's an amazing thing to see the lamb as the picture of the real sacrifice. And us, who having borne the wood and the fire, us, who having had in hand the slaves around us, and the donkey bearing us, being brought even to the very altar, put on the altar of the wood, and being bound... And God, the great Abraham, raising his knife. And Jesus saying, Father, wait, wait. You know the very name Abraham is Father of all living? Can you see how much more beautiful of a picture it is to place you as Isaac and then have you redeemed wow think about it at the last second he was about to plunge the knife now the title to the message today is simple it's just this who is isaac who is mr laughter (laughs) that's his name isaac means what laughter who is mr isaac who is mr laughter And again, more than one way to skin a cat. Now, many have seen Isaac as a picture of Christ. And so it is in many theology books. But Isaac was never killed, you see. The ram caught in the thicket was killed. So let's go through this. Go to Genesis 22, all right? And let's look for just a moment. Genesis 22. I'm not trying to change decades of people's thinking. I realize that individuals will always see Christ in Isaac. And that's good. That's probably fine. But it is just a picture. We do get that, right? It's just an illustration. Don't ever get to a point where you say, well, that's theology. No, it's not. It's just a picture. In Genesis 22, you get this with some fresh perspective. You start with the word Mount Moriah. What does that mean? Mount Moriah. Moriah. Do you know? Anybody? Mount Moriah equals teaching place. Teaching place. The mountain where I get taught. So look up here and think for just a minute. Wouldn't you say then, if Mount Moriah was the teaching place, that we really ought to think about what's being taught? Don't you think? If Mount Moriah is a teaching place, I ought to think really hard and long about what is being taught. What is the right perspective here? What is the right thinking? I would simply ask an examination. Who is Isaac? Who is this kid of laughter? I'd simply ask that. And I believe that Jesus is seen throughout Genesis 22. But I also believe that you are the sons and daughters of the King of Kings. I believe that you are the apple of God's eye. I believe that you are important in the scheme of things. Here you go. I want you to look at four things today with reference to Genesis 22. First of all, you'll see in verses 1 through 3. You ready? We usually do this. We'll go through the outline first. In verses 1 through 3, the temptation of Abraham. All right? The temptation of Abraham, which we've already determined the name Abraham means what? Father of all living. Let's say it together. You ready? One, two, three. Father of all living. Okay, very good. How many of you do hiking once in a while? You ever go hiking, Larry? You back there, you ever go hiking? 
You say, I work enough, right there. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you go hiking once in a while? How about biking? Anybody go biking? All right, these long distance things that we do sometimes, I think we forget that way back in the day, they didn't have to do any exercise because they did their exercise by just living. You know what I mean? Abraham here walked how long to get to Mount Moriah? Do you know? Three days. Imagine this trip. Look with me at verse 1. It came to pass after these things, look at this, that God did tempt Abraham. Go to James chapter 1 and verse 13, won't you? James chapter 1 and verse 13. What does it say in James 1.13? I will give you the rest of that outline in just a minute, but let's establish this. James chapter 1 and verse 13 says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now get this. Hebrew and Greek are two different languages. Do you get that? And here in this sense, it's perfectly translated tempt. But... The significance of tempt can be test. All right. So Abraham, according to Hebrews chapter 11, as you go down through and you look at verses 16 through 20, it says he was tested. When Abraham was tested in the Greek is what it says. And it gives you this understanding. Does God tempt us to do wrong? No, not at all. But can he test you? How many times a day do we get tested? You see, in this case, Abraham's being tested. Now, who? Well, the father of all living. And isn't it interesting that the father of all living actually is who? God. God is the father of all living. Who are you then? Well, you're his what? Sons and daughters. Are there other species of humans somewhere? Oh, come on, you guys. Are there other species of humans somewhere? Man, there's too many Star Wars fans out here. <laughs> Listen, you guys, you're it, all right? According to Scripture, you're it. You're the apple of His eye. There's no other thing that God has created in His image. You are it. Don't you forget that, okay? And as you're looking at the temptation of Abraham, understand that test. It's very important. Number two, I want you to see in the outline... The tenacity of Abraham. All right? Not just the temptation or the test of Abraham, but also the tenacity of Abraham. So you'll put that down just a little bit farther down the page. And then about, uh, you know, three quarters of the way, you'll put the termination of Abraham. You say, now, Pastor, what are you trying to say about that? Well, I'll tell you when we get to it. The termination of of Abraham. And then the last point, the fourth point, is the torture of Abraham. The torture of Abraham. Now, look with me at verses 1 through 3. You saw at the very beginning God's testing of Abraham. Then verse 2 says, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there a burnt offering. Upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. Now people might look at this and say, Well, he's just, you know, figuratively. No. No. He was saying, let's destroy him. Let's get rid of him. And what could very well be the picture here? God deciding as the father of all humans, All right, I'm done with this. I'll just rip up this planet and start over again. That'll be my offering. <laughs> my offering to myself. I'll just tear it all up and get a really good human going here, you know. Let's cook up a whole other batch. This batch has been messed up. Let's get rid of them. And yet you see the greatness and the power of our God. In verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took off two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood. Look at this. He clave the wood. What did he do? He cut up the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose up and he went into the place of which God told him. Now, can I just give you this thought? The test included the death of the only thing that came from him. 
get this, the only thing that came from him in full image. Okay? Well, but he had Ishmael. That wasn't exactly the same thing. You understand this, right? She was Egyptian. Hagar was Egyptian. She wouldn't have been full-bred Israelite. You know what I'm saying? And when you look at the beauty of Sarah and Abraham having a child at nearly 100 years old, that's a whole other ball game. Now, here's the second thing I want you to think about those first three verses. Then we'll go to the second three. You guys still with me? Larry, you still with me? Jeff, you still with me? Look at this. The test included a journey. The test included three days of going and going and going. You know, in the image and the likeness of our God, there's never a time that we need to stop. This journey that we're on is a continual plod. A continual plod. And our Father's already given us the example. He said, look, I made it all for you. What I'm asking you to do is subdue it. And continue forward. And keep marching. Look at number two now and think about these three days for just a minute. And number two, the tenacity of Abraham is also related to those three days. Look at verse four. In fact, read verse four outside with me. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Three days. Have you ever had too much time to think? You ever had too much time to think? Oh, man, they're going to cut my electricity off. They just haven't told me when yet. So all I have to do is sit around and worry about it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Man, oh, they told me they're going to fire me at work. But they keep telling me to come in. I have to think about that thing. How many of you have had children that you've gotten lost into something. I mean, they've had problems. And you think about them all the time. Can you, can you imagine this, Sarah? Can I ask you this question? Lydia, your only daughter. God says to you, in three days, I'm going to kill her. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lydia. I just, it's just, hey, listen, honey. It's just an illustration. But think about that for just a minute. Look at that. Look at that response. Isaac didn't know it. Abraham did. And three days, Abraham was thinking about that death. Thinking about his son. Thinking about Isaac dying. you imagine how broken this man was by the time he finally got to Mount Moriah? My only kid, my only one, oh! And consider what God Himself went through when He made His decision. Of course, you realize nothing occurs to Him. He knew from the very beginning what He was going to do. But the elements carried here in verse 2. The wood, the knife, the fire, the expressions of Isaac. Listen to His expressions. He says, My Father, have you thought about what Jesus said on the cross? Father! What did he say? What? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, who is he talking to? Huh? His father? So who was he talking to? Himself. He's saying uh, to the father of himself. Father, forgive them. Listen, hey, father... Forgive me. Understand what you're going through, dear, dear Jesus, is because of what is happening. He says this. Now listen, this is what Isaac says. Behold the fire, he says, and the wood. But where is the sacrifice? Where is the lamb? And here's what you get. This is beautiful, isn't it? Right at the end, there in verse 8, Abraham said, My son... God will provide Himself a lamb for a burnt offering. What does He mean by that? Doc, you've seen that exegeted a thousand times. What is He meaning by that? Yes! 
So why would we ever say Isaac is the lamb? No, he wasn't. <laughs> you are. In this illustration, okay? In this picture. Now, here's the deal that I want you to get. And I, I hope and pray that you'll understand this by number three. You ready? Do you remember what I said number three is? What is number three? Huh? Yes, the termination of Abraham. As you're going there to verse 9, read with me. Read verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, here's, get, this is interesting. Do we understand that if Isaac dies, Everyone dies. Even the whole world for without Christ. Isaac. Isaac. Not being in existence. All die. Abraham. Abraham. Father of multitudes. Father of all living. Stop. What's going on here? The angels of heaven are screaming out to the Father Himself. Everyone else screaming out. To the Father Himself. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy on us. Oh Father of multitudes. <laughs> and He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to provide a lamb. I'm going to provide a lamb for you. So imagine this. Abraham's termination would have been all of us being gone. Number four. This is it. Sermon's not real long today. The torture of Abraham. Look at verses 12 through 14. Read it with me, won't you? Genesis 22, 12 through 14, and we're done. And he said, yeah, that's good. Read it out. You ready? And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him with a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now read verse 14 together. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. You say, now what? What are you saying, Pastor, by emphasizing Jehovah Jireh? Do we realize that the actual butchering of Christ, who is God, was the torture of Abraham's seed? I mean, in Abraham, Christ was tortured. And somehow, God did it. I don't know how He did it. But how many of you ever heard the term? I think I've said it maybe just two or three times before. But you've heard the term, the hyperstatic union. How many of you know what that is? The hyperstatic union. What's the hyperstatic union? Brad? All God and all men. Somehow He did it, Brad. Somehow He did it. He became 100% human. 100%. You say, now, wait a minute. He's 100% God. I know, that's just the freaky thing. Usually it's 50-50, right? There ain't no 50-50 here. It's 100% God, 100% man. And when he was butchered on the cross, he was butchered because he had to be a man to be sacrificed. And what did he do? He sacrificed himself in the place of all the Isaac of the world. Now, how did he do that? I don't know. But it happened. How many of you have faith that God Himself died on that cross for you? How many of you have faith that His blood shed for you was the sacrificial lamb that all of us needed? How many of you know that God in His grace and mercy poured out Himself? And verse 8 says, He provided Himself a lamb. He said, well, what does all that mean? Jehovah Jireh, baby. God will provide. God will provide. You say, 
Well, that doesn't sound like Isaac at all. It didn't to me either. <laughs> and as I'm reading through Genesis 22, I thought, we're Isaac. The lamb is the one that took our place. You know, my daughter, Rochelle, she likes the snow. But she didn't really know that she liked the snow until it snowed. You know what I mean? Selah and Rochelle went out the other day. And they were out in the snow. And they had some good times. And one thing I noticed was that wherever Selah walked, Rochelle tried to get in the same place because the snow was about as tall as she was, you know. So she had to get in the same spot. God provided the lamb. You know that? But you and I have to get to a point where we understand unless we follow in His steps and allow Him to save us in His way, we're going to get swallowed up. There's never going to be a time that God isn't Savior. There's never going to be a time that any of the pictures and illustrations in the Scriptures somehow involve us Partly saving ourselves. It's not going to happen. We must fully trust in the Father alone. The great Creator. The Father of all mankind. Who took Himself a lamb. Himself a lamb. And replaced us with Himself. Uh, The last and the most important thing you can learn today is this. You and I... If we haven't fully engaged in Christ and allowed Him to take us, we're still hanging over the precipice of hell. And if you're here this morning, you oh, I don't know about hell is real as I'm standing here. And you and I, whew, only by the grace of God. I can't imagine. You know, my friends, I, every day people say, oh, pastor, you shouldn't use that phrase. When you say, when somebody comes and says, how are you? You say, better than I deserve. Oh, you shouldn't use that. It is better than I deserve because I'd be burning in hell right now if it weren't for the grace of God. I should be. But praise His name. I don't have to think about that anymore because of the grace and goodness and perfect power of our God who made Himself the Lamb. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and just think this morning, Lord God, the illustration of Genesis 22 just breaks me. It gives me a new perspective on what I ought to be doing and how I ought to live. Because of the very way that God is, He tested Himself, quote unquote, in essence, for the total destruction of humanity. And decided, now the only way out is for me to give myself to die in the place of all that I have made. What a God. The tenacity of our God. The termination of the King of Kings on the cross to a point where three days later He'd be resurrected. Oh, our Lord, we praise You for the torture that You went through for our salvation. Is there someone here this morning that say, Oh, pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I don't know that I've ever made the decision for Christ. I don't know that. I mean, I, I think I might have, but I just don't know. Would you be honest enough to slip your hand up? You really don't know? Slip your hand up if that's you. I really don't know. Anybody? Okay. Christian brother or sister, have you been touched so deeply by the Spirit of God and the grace of Him that you realize your need to be the evangelist you ought to be? To reach into a lost and dying world and find those ones that are looking for Him? Is there someone here that would say, oh, pastor, pray for me. I'm not exactly right with Him in this. I I'm not being the witness that I need to be. Would you slip your hand up? 
I'm not being the witness I should be. Yes, 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 yes. Anybody else? If you're paying attention, uh, then, then you know what I said. But if you weren't, listen again. Are you the witness you ought to be? If you're not, and you want to be, you really want to be, slip your hand up. Okay, 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 okay. Yes, yes, yes. Do this, dear friends. Stand to your feet, if you will. If you still want to get saved, and you didn't raise your hand for salvation, you come in.